I thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. What a great song. The enemy can't take what we have. There's, yeah, go ahead. That's fine. As the bumper there is playing, we're letting, uh, inviting our children to go to uh, Children's Church. That's pre-K through third grade. Uh, we have so many wonderful workers and servants. Just love all of them, how they help in various ways, whether it's Children's Church or Tidal Wave, youth, uh, sound. We have so many. Of course, we have people that uh, are in the back that are making sure that we're safe in here. So appreciate all of our workers and helpers and servants. So we're going to continue today. I'm glad that you're here. We're continuing our journey through John, defining Jesus as the I am. And of course, if you've been in church very long, you know that those two words together, I am, is something that God used for himself in Exodus chapter 3. And we've been, de been going through this, how John defines Jesus as the I am. Today, we're not going to look at one of the I am passages, but it is Jesus defining who he is as judge and his right to judge and to pronounce judgment or not to pronounce judgment. We'll get into that in just a moment. Our, so, you know, we're going to be in John chapter 8, uh, but also so that you know, this, these first 11 verses in John chapter 8, there's a little bit of uh, argument around theologians if you get into uh, reading theological books, as I know all of you do. You spend hours reading theology, and I'm so proud of you for doing that. So you know exactly where I'm going with this. Uh, <laughs> There's a little bit of disagreement as to where this passage fits. Some say it doesn't uh, fit exactly right in this spot, but in other places. And so, like I said, you know, if you really get into nerdy theology, then you, you know the, the the discussion that goes along with it. But it flows in here and in this passage, leading up to it, just so that you know, Jesus has been talking, and the crowds are amazed, and they say, "Wow, this guy is amazing!" Not just because of what he says, but who he is and what he does. And maybe this could be the Christ. In John chapter 7, uh, the crowds are saying this. In John chapter 7, verse 40 and following, the crowds are saying, maybe he's the one to come, the Messiah. But the Pharisees are saying, whoa, 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 we don't like that. That's not who we think he is. We think he needs to be thrown in jail. We want to arrest him. And so there's this discussion that's going on between the crowds and the Pharisees in John chapter 7, 40 through 53. I won't read all of that. Uh, just a little bit before that, though, Jesus defines himself in verses 37 through 39. He says that uh, Jesus proclaims that all who thirst can come to him, and from his heart will flow rivers of living water. And we alluded to that when we talked about the Samaritan woman at the well. And so the crowds are just amazed. The Pharisees don't like him. But then the very last verse of John chapter 7, it says they went each to his own house. And that's where we're going to pick it up because the crowds dispersed. The Pharisees went back to their house. But Jesus goes over to the Mount of Olives. So we pick it up in John chapter 8 verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, which... So that you know, the setting here, this is in Jerusalem in the fall time of year. It's the Festival of Booths. In John chapter 7 is what it tells us it's going on. The Festival of Booths is the time where the Jews, Hebrews, remembered that back years ago, their ancestors left Egypt, wandered around in the desert, and stayed in temporary shelters. So that's why it's called Festival of booths, and this is celebrated at the fall time of year. I don't know if they had a chamber of commerce type of day like we had, that like we're having today, uh, but man, you know, this is about the right time of year when they were celebrating the festival of booths. Jesus goes up to the Mount of Olives uh, to spend the night, and then verse 2, early in the morning, he came again to the temple. So this is the temple in Jerusalem. All the people came to him and sat down and taught them. So Jesus is having a teaching session. In the temple, his disciples are listening. The, the people around say, okay, what's he going to say today? What's going to happen today? Verse 3, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught 
in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And they continued to ask him. He stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Just think how that said. Uh, uh, what? And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. Really emphasize that. She recognizes who she's in front of. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. This could have been a tragedy. It ends up being a beautiful story. So let's get into this here. And as we get into this, you see the situation Jesus is in. He's teaching, and the scribes and Pharisees bring to him a woman caught in the act of adultery. The way the Greek reads is, they literally caught them in the middle of it, drug her out, either completely unclothed or very little clothing on. So just think of what's going on here. The shame this woman must have felt, the I don't even know what word to use to describe the Pharisees, how, how they, they grab this lady, bring her into the temple as Jesus is teaching. And so just, here's Jesus. He's literally placed between a rock and a hard place because if he goes by the letter of the law, everything he's been teaching would seem null and void. Yet, if he says, well, just let her go, they're going to say, no, no, no. You don't go by the words of Moses, and you, you go against the words of God that God gave to Moses. And Jesus doesn't go by one or two. He finds three. Just like he's done with each of us. So here it is. As we read just a second ago, early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him and sat down and, ta and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, placing her in the midst. They said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? Here's what's going on here. According to the Mishnah, that is the Jewish codified law, the religious leaders were absolutely correct. By stating that she was supposed to be stoned to death, now people from Port Aransas being stoned, that's different than what, okay, what you're used to. All right, I'm just letting you know. Port Aransas, they, they were using rocks. They weren't inhaling anything. So, okay, all right, we're, all right, we're good. Okay, we understand what we're talking about. Got it. All right, so they were going to pick up rocks and throw them at her. And what that means is she was engaged, and actually more than engaged. She was betrothed to a man, the same way Mary was to Joseph. They weren't exactly married yet, but it was a higher level of engagement. And so, according to the Mishnah, the, the right way to handle this, according to the Jewish codified law, is that she was to be killed by the throwing of rocks. That defines a betrothment situation where a woman's caught in adultery. By the way, the law also says that the man is supposed to die. Where's he at? Which leads to a lot of speculation that the scribes and Pharisees set this up for the purpose of catching Jesus. That's interesting, isn't it? Verse 
The situation also reveals the hardness of their hearts. By dragging this woman in the middle of the act, is how the Greek reads, and probably with little or no clothes on. Notice in the previous verses, Jesus in the temple teaching, and the religious leaders interrupt him, wanting to put court in session. They come in, hold on Jesus, court is in session, and you're the judge. Verses 6 and 7, this they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. Notice how Jesus does not respond immediately. When you find yourself placed in a situation where you say, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what the answer is. I think we can take some cues here from Jesus, and we don't have to respond just right away. We don't have to jump to a conclusion. We can pause for a second. Jesus bends down and writes with his finger on the ground. He wrote on the ground and forced the leaders to keep asking the question. As you read the next verse, they continue asking. They just keep asking Jesus, the law says we're, we're to kill. Jesus, the law says we're to kill. Jesus, what do you say? And by so forcing them to keep saying this, he's revealing what's in their heart. Now, what was Jesus writing? We don't know. There's a lot of speculation around this. Some theologians, as I said, you probably don't get into all the reading like, like I do on a on basis when I'm pre preparing a sermon, but some speculate that Jesus is literally writing down the sins of each of the religious leaders that brought this woman in here. And he's writing, yep, uh-huh, you've done that, you've done that. Oh, you, yeah, you've done that, that. Uh -huh, yeah, I saw what you did yesterday. And he's writing, that doesn't say it, that's just speculation. He might have been writing down out the Jewish law, what it actually said. We don't know exactly what he was writing. But he takes time. My suspicion is that as he's writing, whatever he's writing, he's praying, thinking about this woman, and just in his head, probably saying, I'm dying for her. I'm dying for each one of these people also. And he's praying, Father, my speculation, Father, give me wisdom on how to answer this. And I pray for her heart as well as their heart. So Jesus, this is, I just mentioned the, the speculation. And notice from the religious leaders, there is no attempt at reconciliation. They don't get the woman and the fiance and say, listen, there's been a major issue here. What can we do to get you into counseling? What can we do to pray for the two of you? How can we help? There's no concern for this woman. There's no concern for the fiance. We don't know the role that he played in this. Maybe he's in the crowd demanding that she die. We don't know. But there was no concern. They wanted the letter of the law. And you see, that's what legalism does to our heart. It makes us look past the individual and go by the letter of the law, which is why we here at First Baptist, we, we do not want you to get caught up in legalistic outward actions. James talked about it here, how we connect with one another. And the reason why we do that is because God is concerned about the heart. Our outward, outward actions will be what God wants them to be when our heart is what God wants it to be. As they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to him, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. For those of us who want justice for wrongs that have been done, is Jesus excusing sin and being very permissive? Think about the woman's fiancé. We don't know where he was at this time. Jesus is not excusing sin. I suspect that as Jesus was bent down writing, he was thinking of her, think of all the people around. Matthew 7, 1 through 2. We read this at the very beginning of 
of the worship time, of the music time. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Is this saying that there should not be any judgment at all? No, no, no. What Jesus is saying is when you pronounce judgment, you need to look at the heart. Why are you doing this? What's going on inside of you? There's a movement among many churches today to be a part of social justice, which can be a good thing. But we always want to make sure that we allow God to test our heart and be seen as loving others first and foremost. John 8 Matthew 7, Jesus is not espousing political views that endorse anarchy. Jesus is telling us to watch our heart when we pass judgment. Our heart reveals our true intent and often shows the wickedness of passing judgment on a person who got caught doing the very same thing that we're guilty of. Verse 9, but when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. More than anything, this shows the deity or the Godhead of Jesus. Jesus going right to the heart and piercing the heart of even the religious leaders. They had to just stop. Remember, they were constantly continuing asking, Jesus, Jesus, the Mishnah says, the Torah says, Moses told us that this woman is to die. What do you say? You still haven't answered us, Jesus. What do you say? Come on, Jesus. Let him who is without sin be the first to throw the stone. Only God, Jesus himself, showing who he is. Only God could turn the volume down on the legalism. Only God could say, hold on, let's, let's slow down. Are you innocent of everything in the Mosaic Law? Verses 10 and 11. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? I want to stop for a second. Because every one of us could be sitting, standing in the midst of a crowd because no one here is perfect. And we could have accusers. Do you know what he was thinking? Do you know what she said? Do you know what this person did? Do you know what that person did? Every one of us could be in this situation, one form or, or another. Which is why what James said, what he said, the reason why we need to connect with each other in our small groups, in steps, being believers that connect with one another so that we can pray and encourage one another because no one here is innocent without the blood of Jesus on them. So every one of us should put ourselves right here in this woman's position. Has no one accused you? She said, no one, Lord. And I think that is so huge. Her words. She realized that this man who dismissed the crowds with one sentence was Lord, was Master, was someone that she had never been face to face with before in her life. He says, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. So it's Jesus asking her to live perfectly. That's not what he's saying. This is crucial. Not only does Jesus not accuse her, and release her, but he gives her a charge and a purpose. See, what Jesus is saying, go and sin no more, is Jesus' way of saying, because you have been forgiven, live a forgiven life. Have you been forgiven? This is the beauty of this passage. Because you have been forgiven, live a forgiven life. 
Don't go around judging other people because you haven't been judged. You have not been condemned. You've been set free. So release others. The act of forgiveness is something that Jesus is saying, dear lady, you're not being condemned. Don't condemn others. Don't judge others. Love others as I have just loved you. So we enter here this morning as a group of people who acknowledge that there is no one perfect. If you thought you came in here perfect, sorry, we just infected you. It's too late. So now that that's clear, now that we're all infected with the sin stuff, we can come and just say, okay, God, I know that I am not perfect. If anyone could condemn me, Jesus, it's you. Because you are the perfect one. You have the right, Jesus, to throw the first stone. And Jesus didn't. Romans 8, 1 and 2. It's not on the screen. I didn't put it up there. But there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. From the law of sin and death. So Jesus sets her free. We have been set free because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. He lived a perfect life, which is why we're going through the book of John, to see exactly what Jesus did. And because he is who he said he is, and he died and rose again, we now stand not condemned, but uncondemned. So now that you enter here, maybe you've, you've been living a life filled with guilt and condemnation. Listen carefully. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that condemnation is not coming from Jesus. That's Satan. That might, might be self-guilt, but that's not Jesus. Have you confessed it? Release it. If you've confessed it, release it. It's gone. Jesus died for it. I've done this before, but where were you? When Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago plus, where were you? Well, you weren't born, okay? Some of us are old, but we're not that old. So we weren't around at that time. So when Jesus died for our sin, he died for all of our sin. Past, present, and future. Your sin is paid for. So Jesus doesn't condemn you. You've been set free. So let me ask you, have you allowed Jesus to set you free? Are you still holding on to it? There's an issue that oftentimes believers have. We confess our sin. We go to Jesus. We ask Jesus to come into our life. We, we follow Jesus, yet we hold on to past sins because we feel like that we've got to, to, to keep ourselves from experiencing freedom for one reason or another. And that is not of God. That is a lie of Satan. Jesus doesn't condemn us. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Allow Jesus to set you free. You don't have to wear the past. The past is gone. It's paid for. Let it go. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. This beautiful story, as I said earlier, could have been a story of tragedy. A broken relationship. We don't know what happened with the engagement. That wasn't the point of the story. But she was set free. That's the beauty of it. Have you been set free? Have you entered into a relationship with Jesus? If you have, then he has set you free. 
you are now free to live Galatians 5.1. For freedom, Jesus has set you free. For the purpose of being set free. Don't drag yourself down. Don't allow Satan to pull you down. That's why you need a small group. That's why you need somebody to talk to. What are you most ashamed of? And know that everyone would condemn you if they knew your sin and past. Jesus doesn't condemn you. Now listen carefully. I sat at a concert Friday night, and the guy speaking talked about how we like to label ourselves, how we like to put labels on other people. So whether you struggle with adultery, pornography, same-sex attraction, gender identity, lying, gossip, disobedience to parents, whatever the issue is. Did you hear what I just said? Whatever the issue is, you've been set free if you are a Jesus follower. And it's in Jesus where we are made whole. No matter what the past has been. Here's the bottom line. Jesus, the one who has the right to condemn us, wants to set you free. So the question is, have you already been set free? If you have, then go and live a set free life. Live in freedom. Live a forgiven life. John 8, 11, B, neither do I condemn you. Go and from now on, sin no more. Live a life that is a forgiven life, a set free life. Here's a prayer that you might want to pray. You don't have to pray these exact words, but something that the Holy Spirit may lead you to pray. Jesus, help me to receive your forgiveness and the gift of living life without regret. Far too many of us hold on to things that Jesus has already set us free. You don't need to do that. Whether you literally come down here and pray, whether you literally pray right in your seat, or you go home and you kneel beside your bed, I want to invite you today to write down the things that you've been holding on to. And you say, I can't forgive myself. Well, yeah, you can. If God has forgiven you, who are you to not forgive yourself? So yes, you can. If you don't know Jesus, if you haven't entered into a relationship with him yet, this is the offer that Jesus gives you. It's the life of freedom to not be burdened with all this baggage that we carry around. It's life of freedom in Christ. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes for a moment. I'm going to ask guys to come up. Would y'all play God That Saves? I know this is spur of the moment. I just feel like this is something that we need to hear again. Even for those who are saved, we use that terminology. We need rem reminding. We need reminding that God has rescued us. We are set free. And we can hear the song of victory being sung over us because of Jesus. Now, if you do not know Jesus, I want to invite you to hang around after church. Talk to me, talk to one of these guys on stage, talk to one of the ladies that were in the back uh, welcoming you as you came in. We'd love to sit down and talk with you. But for the rest of us who are Jesus followers, this is the, the daily reminder. You've been set free. 
Go and live a set free life. I'd like for us to sing this song together. Let's stand to, together. If you need to pray, you can sit and pray. You can come down here and pray. If you want to talk to me, I'd love to talk with you. Otherwise, let's sing a song of freedom this morning.